Hi, and welcome to Scrum Dynamics, episode 30. My name is Neil Benson, and this is Scrum Dynamics. The mission of this show is to help everyone use the Scrum Agile Software Development Framework to implement Microsoft Business Applications. Just before we get into the show, a quick reminder that you can get your questions featured on Scrum Dynamics by visiting customary.com and clicking on the Send Voicemail button. Leave me a message with your Scrum question, and I'll do my best to answer it on a future episode of Scrum Dynamics. That's the Send Voicemail button on customary.com. And the second reminder is for my Daily Scrum Challenge. The Daily Scrum is an essential everyday event in Scrum, and I've put together a quiz to find out how your Daily Scrum performs, and a 10-day challenge with one idea each day that you can put into use in your team's Daily Scrums and then reflect on it in your next sprint retrospective. To get started, visit customary.com slash daily scrum. Now, on with the show. One of the best practices that experienced scrum teams demonstrate is called emergent design. And in this episode, I'm gonna show you why upfront design isn't working. I'll explain emergent design and why it's better. And finally, I'll share a recent example from my current project. In a traditional sequential project methodology like SureStep, almost all of the work to imagine the solutions that will best meet the requirements are done in the design phase, right after the analysis phase. We did it this way for 40 years. Some teams are still doing design like this, and here is why I think that is crazy. Design is usually done by an architect who most often wasn't involved in the analysis phase so their knowledge is second-hand at best. Tragically, the architects usually haven't met the users and listened to their current pain points firsthand. They get most of their knowledge from the project documentation, principally the Functional Requirements Document, the FRD, as it's known in SureStep. Functional Requirements Documents try to capture what users want and need using natural language. Trying to express exactly what you mean using natural language I think, well, I think it's impossible. If you don't believe me, consider the judicial system in your country. The judiciary exists because the laws written by expert lawyers and passed by the government are open to interpretation. And if we can't write laws unambiguously so that they can be easily understood and agreed by everyone, then I, as a business analyst, I've got no chance with a requirement specification that's supposed to communicate clearly and unambiguously what the users want and need. The perfect requirement specification doesn't exist. It'll never exist. The requirements in the requirement specification are rarely prioritized. And if they are, then the prioritization was done before the design was done. And the design phase is usually where the detailed estimates emerge. This means that someone has prioritized the requirements before knowing how much each requirement will cost. And I can bet you every project sponsor would like to know the cost of each requirement as they prioritize them, not afterwards. Lastly, we design the solution to the requirements when we know least about the system. We haven't built a feature yet. We haven't got any experience building software together as a team. If we're lucky, the next best thing we'll have is a little bit of experience and a little bit of feedback from a prototype. So we're designing what we hope will work without any foundation based on real world feedback. That's pretty scary, hey? So there are reasons why upfront design has been steering us in the wrong direction. Not enough time spent with the customer, reliance on paper specifications written in natural language, prioritization before estimation, and a lack of experience building software together. So here's how emergent design works and why I think it's better. And then I'll share a recent case study. Using emergent design, we let the development team members who are working side by side with the users design the software as they build it. We still have a big picture blueprint, a high level design, which is a sketch of how we think the system and its integrated components might work. We usually also have a set of enterprise architecture principles, agreed up front that guide our system designs while we're building the product. But we don't need to decide 
whether to use a plugin, a workflow, or a Microsoft flow, until the sprint in which we're going to build that feature to meet the requirement that's described in the user story. Let me give you an example from a recent requirement that we had and how we used the practice of emergent design and how we pivoted three times until we achieved the requirement. Our requirement was to integrate Adobe Campaign with Dynamics 365 customer engagement. We needed to replicate contacts from Dynamics 365 to Adobe Campaign and replicate marketing messages and offers from Adobe Campaign back to Dynamics 365. When we planned the project using story mapping, we estimated this epic at around 20 points, which is a medium-sized epic. We assumed we'd use the Adobe CRM connector which promised to make this a configuration exercise. But we adjusted our estimate higher because none of us had previous experience with the Adobe CRM connector and we anticipated potential connectivity issues between Adobe Campaign, which we're hosting in AWS, and Dynamics 365, which is obviously hosted in the Azure data center. We have 2 million club members in Dynamics 365 and the fields that get replicated to Adobe Campaign, we update about 50,000 contacts per day. That's about 30 records per minute. Our Adobe consultant told us that the connector could handle that. What it couldn't handle was replicating large deliveries of email messages and marketing offers from Adobe Campaign to Dynamics 365. We've got monthly and seasonal and weather-driven events that generate a million messages and they need to be replicated to Dynamics 365 within a few minutes. As we went to start this integration epic, we discovered that the connector couldn't handle this kind of volume in that kind of short time span. Fair play to our professional services team from Adobe for the heads up that saved us with the wasted effort of trying. Our next idea was to export the marketing messages and offers from Adobe Campaign to a local file server and use our on-premise FTP service to shuffle the file somewhere that we could pick it up with SSIS and import it into Dynamics 365. We used a similar pattern to push outbound call lists from Campaign into our Genesis dialer. But Enterprise Architects nixed that idea. The on-premise FTP service is, well, let's just say it's not a strategic technology that they wanted to add another workload onto. Idea number three was to export a file from Adobe Campaign to Azure Blob Storage, and then use SSIS to import the file into Dynamics 365. And we quickly found two problems with this design. Firstly, Campaign uses an old Azure API, and it's got a bug. Campaign can read and delete files in Azure Blob Storage, but can't write them. Fat lot of use, that is. And although we're using SSIS and Kingsway Soft for data migration, we're not planning to maintain SSIS for systems integration work. So the final design, the winning design, was to export marketing offers and messages from Adobe Campaign to AWS S3 storage, and then use the Azure Data Factory, Kingsway Soft Azure Runtime toolkit, and grab all those files from the S3 bucket and import them into Dynamics 365. Listen, if we'd done all the design up front, we probably would have locked in on the Adobe CRM connector as the solution for both directions in the integration. We would have written detailed requirements, system architecture design specifications, uh, mapping files and flow diagrams, and all that architecture and design work would have been wasted because it wouldn't have worked. Instead, we spent a little bit of effort building potential solutions, and while we did that, we learned about what worked and what didn't work. Our working prototypes helped our stakeholders refine the requirements and prioritize uh, along the way, and we built a working solution. It met our enterprise architecture principles and our users' requirements at the same time. Bam! All we had to do to finish everything up was to document our as-built system design. That's another thing I love about emergent design. We only need to document the system components that we've actually built that are actually working. We don't waste time documenting designs that never got built. So that's emergent design. That's why I love it. But if you're still clinging to upfront designs, you need to read more about emergent design. Go and explore it, try it out. Courage is one of the core values of Scrum. If you're feeling anxious at the thought of not knowing exactly what you're going to do before you build it, then 
go and be brave. My mission is to help everyone use the Scrum framework to successfully implement Microsoft business applications. If you'd like to learn more about Scrum and achieve your professional Scrum Master certification from scrum.org, then visit scrum365.customary.com to join my Introduction to Scrum for Dynamics 365 course. The course features videos, worksheets, quizzes, and a practice assessment for the Professional Scrum Master certification exam. It covers the theory of Scrum, its events, roles, and deliverables, as well as the lessons I've learned through 10 years applying Scrum to Dynamics 365 projects. That's scrum365.customary.com. Listen, I really appreciate you watching the video that we produce here on Scrum Dynamics. I hope to see you next time. Until then, bye for now.